Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bitcoin News Hour, brought to you by Cafe Bitcoin, the most active Bitcoin club on Clubhouse. During the Bitcoin News Hour, we will cover all the latest headlines in Bitcoin. But this isn't your normal network news show where they talk and you just listen. Today's headlines will be presented and discussed by you, the members of Cafe Bitcoin. To participate in the Bitcoin News Hour, simply change your avatar to the headline you'd like to talk about. Today's moderators will then bring you up from the audience. You'll get one to two minutes to introduce the headline and give everyone the gist of the story. And then everyone will discuss the news before we move on to the next headline. Now, before we get started, do us a favor and click the plus sign at the bottom right of your screen to invite anyone you know who might enjoy this show. And if you're new to Cafe Bitcoin, click on Cafe Bitcoin at the top left and join the club. You can also visit CafeBitcoin.club to find our full schedule of events, as well as a fantastic list of beginner Bitcoin resources. And now, get your headlines ready, because it's time for the Bitcoin News Hour. I really like that guy who does the intro. Seems like a cool fellow. Knows his shit about Bitcoin. Got that nice announcer voice going for him, too. I bet he's really good, good looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, I need some. I need some volunteers. I see Sean just joined us. We need people to change their avatars and uh, see if you take a look and see how Chris did it. So that's exactly what we need from all of you to make this work. Chris, uh, in the meantime, do you want to you want to share your headline? Show everyone how it's done, and I'll uh, I'll look for a headline as well. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we have. Uh... As the headline states, we have a lot of different entities uh, going to be purchasing Bitcoin. So for dentists, offices and uh, dealerships as well. I mean, you know, Tesla really uh, front rent started that whole trend. So uh, this is very bullish news uh, for dentist offices and other businesses to continue to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet is just very bullish news for Bitcoin. So I saw that here today and uh I was like, all right, let me let me go ahead and share this news here today. I actually shared the screenshot on Twitter a little bit earlier, so I thought it was pretty dope. Uh, it just shows that mass adoption is happening as we speak, so I thought it was pretty dope. And uh, you guys can chime in on that. Definitely bullish. Bullish all around. Welcome to Sean. Uh, let's see if we have anyone else with headlines or hands raised. No, we just got a bunch of mooches who want to hear the news for free. All right, folks, I guess uh, you're going to make us do all the work here. Um, I'm going to do a uh, I'm going to share an article right now, and I think I'm just going to read it real quick because it isn't too long. And I think it's important. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you may have noticed uh, people like Terrence and myself have not only laser eyes, but we have these green squares over our eyes now. Um, and this has to do with something called Taproot, which uh, hopefully you're familiar with. Um, this article comes to us from Bitcoin Magazine, Everything You Need to Know About Taproot Signaling by Bitcoin Miners. <clears throat> the latest Bitcoin network difficulty adjustment was the most significant one in quite some time. Besides being a uh, negative 12.6% downward adjustment unprecedented during a bull market, and one of the largest downward adjustments in Bitcoin's history, it also marked the beginning of the signaling period for taproot activation. A few hours after the adjustment, slush pool mined blocks 600, no, one block, sorry, 681,458 with the version, uh, this is too technical, maybe I shouldn't read this. <laughs> anyway, the first block signaling support for taproot. What, what followed was a wave of support from throughout the Bitcoin community and some of the best media Teams in recent memory, both of which we greatly appreciated. However, there was also a good deal of confusion about how signaling works, what it means, and why other mining pools had been mining blocks that didn't signal support for Taproot. For all the non-technical Bitcoiners out there, we want to clear up the confusion as well as briefly explain why we support Taproot in layman's terms. So how miners signal support for Taproot? When miners signal support for any Bitcoin protocol update, or a BIP, they are essentially saying that they are prepared to run a certain version of the Bitcoin node software, which implements the updated code. In the case of Taproot, we signaled our support by putting a 4 at the end of the version bits uh, 0x2f900004 in the block that we mined. 
There were many blocks mined prior to block 681,458, which weren't signaling support. Some people speculated that this was because the version of Bitcoin Core that does the signaling, version 0.21.1, had only been released hours prior to the difficulty adjustment, not giving mining pool operators su sufficient time to upgrade. In reality, this isn't fully accurate. We were not waiting on the edges of our seats for the official Bitcoin Core release so that we could update our nodes and signal immediately. This is because the act of signaling can be completely separate from whichever version of the node software we are actually running. What we actually did was simply make some small tweaks in our mining pool software to inject the four at the end of the version bits in all of the block templates we were sending to our miners for them to hash. In other words, we did not need to update our mining servers in order to signal publicly that we are prepared for taproot activation. Now that this is cleared up, little aside, Bitcoin Magazine, that's not really layman's terms. I think they can do better. But anyway, now that this is cleared up, we can tell you that it's actually very easy for mining pools to signal support since it doesn't even require updating the node software. Therefore, all mining pools who have, pre who have already publicly stated support for Taproot should have no troubles in signaling that support through the version bits in the near future. Uh, I'm just going to skip ahead, skip ahead. For those who don't know much about Taproot, we wrote a not-too-technical explainer while conducting our own research last year, which summarized and linked in the thread below. Um, in a nutshell, Taproot makes more complex transactions, such as those involving multi-sig setups and opening and closing of lightning channels, appear on the Bitcoin blockchain as ordinary transactions. This saves block space, improving scalability, and hides distinguishing features of the transactions from the public, i.e. it improves privacy. Supporting Taproot is a no-brainer, and we encourage our fellow mining pool operators to start signaling support quickly to keep this upgrade uncontroversial. Uh, and if you're just a regular Bitcoiner out there, you can show your support by putting uh, green blocks and green lasers over your eyes like Terrence. Anyway, sorry for that. It went on a bit longer, and I thought it'd be a bit more informative than it was. But uh, Taproot is important. If you don't know about it, go read up about it. And looks like we've got some new headlines. So why don't we go to Sean, who, uh, who is next up on stage? What do you got for us, Sean? Hey, guys, how's it going today? Brecky, my story is obviously the same as yours uh, regarding the taproot signaling and what the, what the miners and the pools are actually doing behind the scenes there. And I'll give you uh, maybe uh, a truncated layman's version term compared to what you just read with uh, Bitcoin Magazine. But basically, there's a big uproar on Twitter because all the pools weren't signaling right away for, for the actual speedy trial activation, right? And people were wondering why this ha was happening. But um, according to Jimmy Song um, and his, I just asked him a question on his um, newsletter he put out, um, they actually... Uh, are kind of waiting for um, the binary to be released behind the scenes so that, that they can upload that into their software. And I don't know, like you just read, if, if they don't have to update their software or they ju can just basically update the, the number in there, like you said. But basically, the long and short of it is the majority of the pools are on board. If you go to taprootactivation.com, um, Poolin is running this site and shows that currently over 86% of the pools on the network right now um, have indicated that they will be signaling to implement this. And it's just gonna take a little bit more time to do the behind the scenes work. So there's uh, that site, taprootactivation.com, and then also um, taproot.watch, which you can see in real time, the blocks that are actually being signaled. So long and short, it's positive. Um, it most likely it will happen in the next difficulty adjustment just uh, takes a little bit longer behind the scenes. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Sean. Uh, I noticed we've got a couple people with their hands raised, but you don't have a news uh, headline as your avatar. Do us a favor. Go find a Bitcoin news article that hasn't been done already. Change your avatar to that headline so that we can follow along um, and then raise your hand and then we will be happy to bring you on up. Uh, let's go to Terrence. Terrence, what do you got for us? Uh, sure. So basically, there's a great uh, Twitter account called Documenting Bitcoin. And this tweet is just about how the mean hash rate for Bitcoin, which took a big dip that coincided with a big drop, quote unquote, big drop in the Bitcoin price where it went to a price not seen in two weeks or something from like 62,000 to 49,000. Anyway, the, the hash rate dropped like 30 percent or something, mostly out of China. But now the hash rate has recovered 
and is approaching new all-time highs, and that's considered bullish. So good news for the security of Bitcoin as the higher the hash rate, the more secure. Love to see that. All right, moving on. I think Justin was next. Justin, what do you have for everyone today? Oh, wait, real quick, sorry. Um, for everyone who's presenting articles, if you wouldn't mind, please share the link in the companion Telegram chat, uh, which is, um, I think it's t.me slash Bitcoin Clubhouse. Justin, take it away. Sure, thanks. So um, a, uh, a leaked email from the uh, an internal email of the London-based banking app Revolut, which allows their users to... Um, Buy Bitcoin, amongst other cryptocurrencies. Um, they're going to be allowing their users to transfer their holdings off of its app and into their own custody and cold storage. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple things. I've never heard of this uh, Revolut. Um, I'm guessing mainly because it's um, based in the United Kingdom, but it seems like they do have they do have U.S. users. Um, so this could be a good option for some of our friends in the U.K., um, but uh, hopefully it forces, um, you know, PayPal and Robinhood to move in that same direction as well. Um, always like to see uh, when companies uh, move towards self-custody so, um, or the ability to self-custody. So that's always a positive. Yeah, Justin, Revolut is um, actually very large. Um, I'm glad you found the same headline that I found and totally acknowledge you getting it first. Uh, they have 1,500 employees, I believe. It's very, very substantial in the UK. Um, they do tens of millions of dollars in revenue at least. Uh, it's been around since 2015. Uh, profitable. They're expanding their staff. Um Anyway, so, sorry about that. Felt appropriate. Welcome, Aaron, to the stage. And Aaron. We have two Aarons. Holy moly. Um, let's go to Mithun. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. What do you have for us today? Hey, Breggy. No, that, that's good. Um, I just wanted to share something that I... Wait, hold on, hold on. That was like a, that's good enough. All right, how do I actually say it? <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. It's, um, it's Mithun. <laughs> Mithun, okay. It's not that hard. I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to share uh, Charlie Munger's comments over Bitcoin. I think it was over the weekend during the annual uh, shareholder event that um, Berkshire Hathaway held. Um, and, you know, I mean, this guy, um, I mean, I have respect for Charlie Munger in general and his investment philosophy, but the the way he talks about Bitcoin and uh, his disdain for Bitcoin is <laughs> just, um, um, it's funny to me when I, when I hear those comments when, when he says that, you know, Bitcoin is not real. It's it's it's, it's disgusting to think that, to see that Bitcoin is rising at the rate it's rising, yeah, and and he hates for whatever reason he still thinks that Bitcoin is tied to extortionists and criminals, and they use it uh, for their purposes. And he's just ill-informed or maybe just not interested in it um, to um, to educate himself. But uh, but he has he has a big microphone, and and the entire world listens to him when he speaks. So. I just wanted to share, you know, what he's been talking about, about Bitcoin and then how mainstream media in general has been kind of giving him a lot of, uh, a lot of. Yeah, disappointing, but kind of par for the course. Anyone want to comment on that? Aaron Wise, maybe, or Terrence or anyone who's up here? I just feel like it's hilarious that um, we're, we're listening to 90-year-old legacy system investors and worrying about their opinion. And if you compare it to how much Buffett and, and Munger hate on gold historically, so, it's no surprise that they hate even more on Bitcoin. So um, they're the last gasp effort of a dying legacy system personified. And I don't care what they say. Absolutely. They're my trigger word as what we were saying yesterday in the uh, Orange Co podcast listening party. We were saying that uh, anytime we hear, Anybody crying about Bitcoin on the mainstream media? That's your that's your uh, signal to smash by on SwanBitcoin.com. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I feel about shilling in the newsroom, but uh, I guess we'll allow it. We'll allow it. And I'd also <laughs> say it pains me to say this as someone who actually attended for the Berkshire 50th annual meeting and was a fan of 
Buffett and Munger, still am in some ways, but this is to me an example of um, legacy folks, whether it's in finance or they also have this problem in science where professors, the, the biggest barrier to scientific progress is often um, older established professors who, before they pass away, kind of block new ideas that don't support and go against their old thesis that as science evolves, the, um, the, 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 um, their old theories are no longer valid. So sometimes scientific progress depends on folks um, kind of leaving the stage, so to speak. And I see the same thing happening with money and just how people invest their, their savings and assets. Bitcoin is a savings account and a lot of people don't get it and they never will. And it's unfortunate but um, this will change as they too. And I always find it interesting because I think that, you know, the, the investment thesis, so to speak, that we all have for the most part really is buy and hold and, and hodl. And in a lot of ways, that's pretty similar to the way to the investment thesis that, you know, uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett had to base, buy and hold good companies based on the fundamentals. And, and that's what we're doing, buying and holding Bitcoin based on. And what they did, did and do used to work in the legacy system before money printing came along. But if you look at their actual returns, even they haven't even beat the S and P over the past fifteen years. So um, they haven't adapted to the new future. So yep, adapt or die. We'll see what happens. Um, did someone have their hand raised? No, they don't. Anyway, folks, come on now. Go find an article, join us up on the stage, share your thoughts, but most importantly, find something interesting about Bitcoin and share it with us. There's lots and lots of news happening and we're here to talk about it. All right. Um, can I just, Aaron, quick, we... quick, can I just, I just hopped up on stage. I wanted to comment on the Charlie Munger story, sure, sure. if that's okay. When I saw that this morning, I just want to say it gave me such delight because <laughs> It just made me laugh and feel better about being invested in Bitcoin than I have ever been before, because this is a guy who has made a fortune on big pharma, big ag, big food, dis destroying the environment. I know we don't get into into politics here, but um, but, uh, you know, the commentary, I forget who was just saying it about sort of the last gasp of a dying breed. Um, a business person. That's really how it hit me. And so, um, I don't know, I just, it made me feel, it, it, it reaffirmed all of the reasons why I love Bitcoin. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Deborah. Yeah, the, the, the real shame is that we can't use these living fossils for fossil fuels, in, in my opinion. That's the real shame. <laughs> but anyway. Soon enough. Soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> Soon enough. All right. Um, the, the Aaron's. Did we get to either of your stories? I don't think we got to either of them. Aaron Jolie, I think you were up here first if you want to, if you'd like to share. Sure. So my, my story is S&P goes live with Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto indices. The financial data giant has launched, it, uh, launched its first three crypto index products. I'm going to skip over the second two. Uh, but Today it went live. It's a ticker SP, SPBTC, and it is uh, their attempt to mirror Bitcoin price appreciation. So it'll be short lived with hopefully ETFs coming around the corner, but uh, nonetheless, a step in the right direction to gain broader. Thank you, Aaron. Anyone like to comment? <laughs> uh, very good comment. not actually um, CME also has uh, changed its contract size to 0 0.1 Bitcoin uh, so that means it's uh, within the reach of more people to uh, 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 trade in their uh, future contract thank you Rajbinder Aaron, next Aaron what do you got for yes. us? Yeah, so Raj just introduced it. So my headline was that, the uh, launch of the mini uh, Bitcoin future contract on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, so as Raj said, it's one-tenth of one Bitcoin, uh, which is a mini feature. 
the prior big contract, uh, the full future Bitcoin contract on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange was five Bitcoin. Uh, so it just began trading today. Uh, opening print was 140 contracts. Um, CME is uh, providing a reference rate. The uh, CF, uh, it has its own reference rate for the price of Bitcoin. And it's very important as a reliable um, reference rate for Bitcoin in that it is entirely domiciled within the U.S. with the U.S. trading on U.S. exchanges. And it is um, subject to all of the regulation in Illinois. And it's an important reference rate for the S. EC to understand the actual price of Bitcoin um, versus the reported volume on offshore exchanges that they can't rely on. Uh, CME has done, uh, just finally I'll conclude, CME's uh, doing actually very, very well in their Bitcoin product. Uh, volume for the first quarter in the big contract was up 43% year over year. Uh, average daily volume exceeds 13,000 big contracts. Um, and this is just going to add volume to the contract. So generally, I feel it is very bullish to provide more reference rate pricing with the mean. How much is the minimum? You said point. Uh, so the new e-mini, the new mini contract is a tenth of one Bitcoin. Aaron, what's the leverage offered on CME compared to other futures um, platforms? Do you know? Um, to my knowledge, it is not, uh, they do not allow leverage. So you have to have that one tenth of one Bitcoin as collateral. And then does the fact that they only trade, um, Wall Street hours, like Monday to Friday, nine to five affect, um, who and, and how much can be, can actually be traded on there in your opinion? Uh, not particularly. They actually use um, a commodity market, which is a different hour. It actually opened at 6 p.m. last night, technically. Um, so not particularly. It is more difficult to get access to that exchange. So not like every traditional brokerage account in the world has access to CME. Uh, usually it's pretty larger players. So I think really what the industry is waiting for is a common retail product, which will be the ETF. So we're still kind of waiting on that, but it just has been in the interim period, uh, you know, a product that is at least trustworthy enough for some major institutions like, you know, Genesis is on there. Um, I think uh, Monex Group through TradeStation is on there, XPTO, uh, all of the commodity traders in the, in Chicago, Jump, um, you know, various different players are on there. You can also trade CME products, but it's got not usually for the re common retail trader because the deposits are pretty large. To hey folks, we've got some, we've got a lot of new folks in the room. I just do want to do a quick reset on how this, uh, how this room works. So if you take a look at everyone on the stage and uh, pull down to refresh, you'll see that everyone, most people have their, uh, avatar set to a headline so if you'd like to present a headline and we encourage everyone to uh to do so don't be shy go find a bitcoin headline that has not been presented yet uh something from today preferably change it to your change your avatar to a photo of that headline and then you will come up and present for two to, two to three minutes tell us the gist of the story uh and then maybe we will discuss all right let's move on to raj raj what do you have for us so this is a kind of an op-ed from Coindesk, and I found it very interesting because it covers a point which has been less on our radar screen in our rooms here and in the community in general, but it is becoming more and more significant, which is the potential of Bitcoin as collateral. And uh, if you listen to Michael Saylor's uh, interviews at certain points, he talks a lot about it. And uh, that's because he calls what, uh, 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 what's known as pristine collateral means collateral whose value is very solid and uh, it's uh, not going to rot and uh, there is no subjectivity involved. It's very easy to evaluate. And uh, uh, for that reason, he says uh, Bitcoin is going to be the best uh, co uh, pristine collateral for corporations because the other kind of collaterals you have, uh, they may deteriorate in quality and that leads to the kind of crisis like in November 2019 when there was a overnight repo rate spike because banks did not trust one another's collateral. 
So they were asking for extremely high overnight rates and the Fed had to uh, 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 jump in and provide them a lot of liquidity, meaning give them funds to uh, keep operating within the rules that are imposed on them uh, post uh, the global financial crisis. So when it comes to pro uh, potential of Bitcoin as a collateral, if you think about two parties on the side of a deal, uh, the lender wants to know for sure how good the collateral is, and the borrower doesn't want to be on the hook for any criminal liability in case he or she ends up making a, a statement that isn't exactly true in terms of how the collateral's value behaves. So the collateral might have uh, uh, you know, uh, things that go wrong with it uh, or its value falls. So uh, you end up having to over collateralize, which is a higher cost for the borrower or a risk on the side of the, uh, on part of the uh, lender who has to now deal with something that might not be as valuable as it was when the deal was struck. So uh, this article talks about uh, Bitcoin's potential as collateral and how the uh, um, Bitcoin collateralized loan market is increasing in size. Uh, I encourage everyone to read the details in this one, but the overall uh, uh, message is that as Bitcoin matures, it's instant verifiability and uh, it's uh, uh, nature as uh, hard money, which is appreciating very fast, makes it an immensely valuable uh, asset for corporations to have on their balance sheets so that whenever they need to raise money, they can use it as collateral, which will be grabbed by any lender very quickly uh, uh, in terms of uh, making a deal. I'm sure Terence, coming from Wall Street, has a, a better way to articulate. Uh, yeah, I just have a question. I don't know if they've talked about what the haircut might be on Bitcoin because it's so volatile. Even though it's appreciating asset and so forth, it is very volatile and it has gone down. So, like, um, my understanding, my, the, the way it typically works that I've seen it done by Wall Street players is if you have something like short dated US treasuries or cash or cash equivalents, commercial paper, whatever, those don't really have a haircut, meaning a discount to the, the net asset value. And then with um, other products like longer term treasuries, mortgage backed securities, things that are riskier, corporate bonds, like double A corporate bonds or whatever, um, they get discounted. So you actually have to over collateralize. So I don't know if like I would expect that Bitcoin would need to be over collateralized by most folks because it's kind of like a, you're securing a um, liability or, or receivable. Like if you have a loan, it can be collateralized. If you have a swap, it can be collateralized. And the kind of value that of that collateralization, you can the over collateralization is just to protect against the the risk that you default and the collateral goes down at the same time. So Bitcoin can go down when y your counterparty is um, no longer able to pay the interest when, or in principle when. That's exactly correct, Terence. And the article goes kind of qualitatively over that issue because, okay. you know, maybe okay. I borrow money from you today and, uh, uh, you know, the collateral is my Bitcoin and tomorrow Bitcoin is down by 10%, which happens. It's still happening occasionally. So, you are absolutely right. There is going to be over, over collateralization. Uh, and the other thing is liquidity. Uh, so Terence is right. Over collateralization is not going to go away because it's volatile. Once the volatility dies down, it will become less significant. But liquidity is just as significant because if you're a lender and you had to uh, uh, um, uh, take the collateral because the borrower didn't pay up, now you want to sell that collateral and get your money back. Then you have to have a liquid market to be able to sell it. To that effect, Tesla's sale of uh, about, I think, 10% of their uh, uh, Bitcoin holdings was a great test of the market. And Elon Musk referred to it in in a tweet where he was challenged about, uh, 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 you know, how Tesla made more money from Bitcoin or he has weak hands or something like that. Anyway, the point is that the liquidity is also proven and it will only get proven more and more. So uh, Bitcoin as collateral is going to become a much bigger thing than it. Hey, Terrence, real quick, what is a, what is a collateralization rate for gold? Do you know? Is it like 70%? Or? Um, that's a great question. I Gold was not used as collateral, at least not on the deals I worked on. I, I worked in fixed income, so it's mostly with um, bonds, treasuries, 
corporates, um, municipals, and things, junk bonds, uh, investment grade bonds, things like that. So that was the usual collateral. And then you had like cash equivalents, but like super short dated U.S. treasuries. Um, cool. but, but it would go down to like 70%, if I recall, maybe 50% for like junkier bonds. So I don't know about gold, but that's a good point. They, gold should be usable as collateral because it's not as volatile and is a longer term store of value. It's just there's shorter term price fluctuation. So it definitely will be, um, you, you will need over collateralization if you use gold. Um, at least that's what most creditors would want or trading. Thanks for sharing that, Terrence. Let's go to Sam Bones. What do you have for us today? Thank you. So this is just a release that a MLS soccer player is um, using Bitwage to convert some of his salary into Bitcoin. And I'll read some quotes for it, from it because I think it's really interesting. But I just want to contrast this to the Charlie Munger, Buffett kind of sentiment and just kind of remind myself and I guess everybody that change is hard and admitting you were, you were wrong is, is hard and that um, change might happen in our lifetime and different things like that. I know there was a video, too, of Bill Meyer, I believe, Mayer, um, kind of talking about crypto and well, Bitcoin and all that, how silly it is. And I had just recently watched the interview of David Letterman and Bill Gates and Bill Gates explaining the Internet to him and Letterman making fun of it. So it's kind of interesting. But here's some quotes from the article. And this is what Bitcoin is kind of doing, too. It's interesting to see how the people choose the currency out of need and, and desire. But um, he says, the soccer player says, the rate of inflation is killing us. The more the U.S. prints money during COVID to help people, the more it devalues our currencies. So my family, when I send them money home, I send them Bitcoin. If I wanted to send them money to my parents to move away from a state that I felt was really violent, I couldn't send them money. I couldn't send the money to the bank. It was just through Bitcoin that I was able to send my family money more easily and as efficiently as possible. So it's interesting to see that that happening. Yeah, he's in Nigeria, and we yeah. also I tweeted earlier that Nigeria is surging in peer to peer Bitcoin transactions. So they're leading the way by default because they don't have any other choice. So I think you're absolutely right on with that. In America, we're blessed enough to use it as an asset or a or an investment or a savings account. And in other parts of the country, which is what I always tell people, you guys got to look at other countries. We're not the only people on the planet. <laughs> they have to use this <laughs> to transact and for people to send their families money because the system in those countries are corrupt. So, And it wasn't Ethereum. So they're, they're choosing Bitcoin over that. But I guess we have the blessing of being able to choose between other crappy coins to try and make Sorry, folks, just dealing with a telemarketer. Thank you all for that story. Uh, let's move on to, boy, it looks like we only have one more. D++, what do you got for us? Oh, hey, yeah. Um, the news for today is that I'm hodling. Um, my girlfriend's out at a lesbian bar, um, but I'm hodling, and it's because I'm a bad trader, and I know I'm a bad trader. Uh, good traders can spot the highs and the lows, Pit pat, piffy, wing, wang, wong, wang, just like that, and make a million bucks, sure, no problem, bro. And likewise, the weak hands are like, oh no, it's going down, I'm gonna sell, he, he, he. And then they're like, oh my god, asshole, when the smart traders who know what the fuck they're doing buy back in. But you know what? I am not a part of that group. When the traders buy back in, I'm already a part of the market capital, so guess who you're cheating? Day traders, not me. Uh, and they say, oh, you should have sold. Yeah, no shit. No shit, I should have sold. I should have sold moments before every sell and bought moments before every buy. But you know what? Not everybody's as cool as you. If you only sell in a bear market, if you're a good day trader or an illusion noob, the people in between hold. In a zero-sum game such as this, traders can only take your money if you're selling. So I'm hodling. Hodling. <laughs> hodling. Uh, awesome. I don't know if that quite qualifies as a news story, but uh, I enjoyed that. So, uh, so that was good. 
Does anyone else up here have a different headline? Did you change to a different one and I didn't notice? Aaron, does that look like a different story? Yeah, um, just a note here. Coinbase today announced that it acquired uh, Deep Plus Plus. I loved your... Uh, I love their reading from 2013. That was awesome. Uh, Coinbase today announced that it acquired SKU. SKU is kind of like a data analytics visualization company for crypto. Um, I thought that was less important, interesting sign. Um, but importantly, in that blog post, they noted that they now store $122 billion worth of institutional money, which is half of its total assets. So Coinbase holds... 223 billion total assets as of March 31st. Half of that is institutional. I thought that was a really important data point. Um, I would assume, um, I would assume something like 100 of that 122 billion is Bitcoin. I don't know the the number, but I would just guess that, and that would place institutional crypto in custody at Coinbase at 10% of Bitcoin's market cap, which I think is an important stat to know for ballpark figures. An incredible amount of money. Incredible amount of money that they. And how would you feel, Aaron, allowing Coinbase to custody your keys? Well, um, what I do know is that a lot of companies trust them. And so they are becoming a really important custodian to watch as we go forward into this brave new world. That might be all we've got for today, folks, unless anyone in the audience wants to quickly run and find a, another headline, or if anyone up here wants to uh, dive into any of the headlines we were sharing. Um, I, I have a headline that I saw on Twitter and I promised to find it and tweet about it or, but um, I can't find it right now, but basically it said that Africa and, and this touches on what the, the other person just said, I, I forget who is speaking, but Africa is leading the way among all the continents and growth of peer to peer Bitcoin transactions. Um, so look for, and that goes to the, to the sentiment that, um, or the, the theory that if you live in a under a regime where the government is maybe more incompetent or more corrupt than normal, then you have to find alternatives and Bitcoin exchanging Bitcoin peer to peer to get your goods and services is a great way to do it um, because it's so hard to stop and it's a reverse. Terrence, you were talking about China. No, um, Africa, Africa, but yeah, that would, that would be true in China as well. I would think. Um, China maybe has more of their people um, habituated to use um, digital payments, like with their phone. They just pay everything with their phone. Nobody uses cash, pretty much. Whereas, at least in the U.S., sometimes, some sometimes people still do use use cash uh, on a. There's yeah, a no, picture of that map on documenting Bitcoin, but it does show kind of the Asian countries as like second place. So. Yeah, there was a there was a story well, out today. From, yeah, there was a story out today from Reuters. Uh, they're implementing new anti-fraud policies in China. Um, I think in China, yeah, Reuters reported six thousand peer-to-peer platforms have been shut down in China uh, last year. China uh, busted over seven thousand five hundred scams, according to the regulator, uh, which was up. 27% the prior year. They for some, somehow published these numbers from the governmental authorities. I'm not sure what right, it's coming from Reuters. Um, there were 20 in Shanghai. Uh, various, they named various platforms. So they're just launching this as well. Yeah, it's becoming really difficult to operate in China. They obviously want to make sure that everyone uses their DCEP tools. In the- Uh, to the African news, Wakanda forever, guys. I feel like Bitcoin would actually make Wakanda possible. Absolutely. All right, folks, that might be it for the news hour. Any closing words, closing comments?
or sound effects of leaving your mic on, that's totally cool as well. <laughs> All right, everybody. Wait, somebody have their hands raised? No. Is that a headline I see? Ah, I see a headline. All right. We got one more headline coming up. Patrick Nash, come on up to the stage. What do you got for us? Okay, I'm here, guys. Sorry. This one is from uh, last week. It's from the business section of Texas Monthly, which is a boomer magazine. If you go down in Texas, it says, amid a Bitcoin boom, Texas leaders get cozier with cryptocurrency. A resurgent mining industry is lobbying the legislature to make the state friendlier to the blockchain. So what this is basically talking about is a bill that is going through the Texas House of Representatives right now. Um, it has to go through the House, and then if it gets passed, it goes to the Senate. But it's basically adding a definition of Bitcoin and virtual currencies um, to the Uniform Commercial Code. It's aiming to be very similar to what Wyoming passed um, earlier, I guess it was last year. Uh, uh, it's a it's a pretty good article. It's just it, it's just exciting exciting stuff going on in Texas. I mean, you know, they interview a miner and talk about the importance of of Bitcoin, and then they go into your typical energy fud, uh, which I guess is I don't know. Maybe the writer had to put something in there about energy fud, but um, anyway, exciting stuff going on in Texas. That's what we like to hear, Patrick. Just find us some gas. We'll come hook up. Yeah, it's uh, the, the miner that they interview is is rhodium mining. They have a um, they have a substantial amount of A6 down at Winstone's facility um, in Rockdale, which is taking power. That's actually directly from the grid. But uh, um, yeah, and also I guess I, I can say this. I, I know that one of the um, key crypto or Bitcoin, really, the, the, the bill is, is for Bitcoin. So I was actually at the legislature to testify um, in front of the committee uh, that was like the banking and finance committee to to make it through the first steps. And I was there with the CEO of Unchained Capital, um, who was a key part of um, structuring the bill, uh, because it, what it really is, is helpful for is, is for um Custodians, I guess if you could call Unchained a, a custodian, I mean, they really utilize multi-sig technology. And so uh, it, it, going back to the uh, Bitcoin as perfect collateral, I mean, that's really what this is about. So that, um, for example, if you want to get a loan against your Bitcoin, it's much easier for a company like Unchained Capital to facilitate that loan if, the definition, if there's a definition of Bitcoin in the Uniform Commercial Code. Right now it's in a gray area. And so... They just can't give like the interest rates aren't as good as they should be um, and things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, like because the disconnect here with the pristine collateral narrative to me is the fact that the interest rates offered for someone who wants to actually put their Bitcoin up are just not attractive, attractive enough yet to take that risk. So I can't wait for all these guys to come online and get the interest rates more in line so the market actually incentivizes uh, um, that market to uh, become established. Yeah, it's potentially the best form of collateral that's ever been created. I mean, it's a much better form of collateral than, say, um, like a home, which is, you know, the most popular form of collateral for anyone to, to put up for, for a loan. Um, you know, think of like, you know, remortgaging your house or taking out a second mortgage to, to start a business or something like that. Um, so anyway. Hey Roger. Mike. Hey Brecky, if you'd like, um, I can wrap up the hour with just kind of a quick, fire summary of any of the missing headlines from today sure feel free just, yeah just in a just in a sentence or two a piece um just some of the things that i noticed in the news uh sec commissioner hester pierce uh believes she issued a statement saying that the continuing growth of dollar peg stable coins will help support 
the U.S. dollar against China's effort to dethrone uh, USD with their digital yuan. Just an interesting statement from her. She's positive on CBDCs. Also on CBDCs, the Bank of France, uh, the Central Bank of France, said that uh, it issued 100 million euro bonds on a blockchain. Uh, that was an experiment to test the settlement of a central bank digital currency. Uh, in the UK, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is kind of like the internal IRS, said that uh, refuted a rumor that it was planning to crack down on people, uh, said it was not actively planning to crack down on people to failing to divulge crypto trades, just simply reiterated that it does uh, require people to disclose their trades. Uh, it called claims, Her Majesty's Revenue, Revenue and Customs called claims by um, an accounting firm as scaremongering. Um, Australia is recommending uh, the use of a blockchain-based registry, which is interesting, Re recommending that the national cabinet there uh, provide uh, clarity regarding digital assets and the support of blockchain-based land registries as um, legally authoritative. Uh, Chinese mining equipment supplier Canaan um, announced a securities purchase agreement of $170 million for its American depository shares. Uh, Bit Digital ended uh, first quarter with uh, $30 million in cash. Bit Digital is a, another um, mining company. Uh, the Inter Intercontinental Exchange, which was an investor in Coinbase, sold down $900 million of its stake in Coinbase. MasterCard, uh, MasterCard CEO said that the credit card company is interested in developing CBDCs, uh, continuing its sandbox with inside which several central bankers around the world are uh, working on their central bank digital currencies. Fidelity introduces digital assets analytics. Uh, Fidelity Digital Assets has a new analytics solution helping institutional investors navigate digital assets by bringing comprehensive data coverage and intuitive analytics tools into a central location. Uh, Mercado Libre, which is a very large e-commerce store in Latin America, has begun listing properties in Argentina, requiring investors to purchase those uh, real estate properties in Bitcoin. Um, black cabs across the UK and Scandinavia are now enabled to accept um, various cryptos for hailing of taxis. Coinbase added PayPal as an on-ramp. Uh, so if you have only a PayPal account, even without a debit or a inside Coinbase. Uh, rounding up the headlines, Thailand. Uh, the government of Thailand is planning to require local digital currency exchanges to verify KYC. Switzerland is testing cross-border digital currencies. China, as we mentioned earlier, is uh, implementing new anti-fraud policies. Turkey is still cleaning up the mess of its exchanges going offline and the owners running away with the money. Uh, Galaxy Digital is partnering with a yield enhancement thing that I won't go into. Also, Valkyrie is offering some sort of shitcoin trust with staking, which I'll ignore. Nine point Turing uh, received a receipt for its final prospectus to turn its closed ended Bitcoin trust into an ETF on the Toronto Stock Exchange in Canada. So that'll be interesting to look forward to in Canada. Nine Point Partners applying for conversion of its Bitcoin trust into an ETF. Also, on the ETF news in Australia, the Australian Securities Exchange is, quote, spending an enormous amount of time end quote, focused on Bitcoin ETF applications and could launch Australia's first Bitcoin ETF by the end of the year. And Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment has um, declined. Uh, Mon Charlie Munger commented on Bitcoin. Obviously, we already covered that. And finally, the UBF, UBS's chief economist said there's something weird about continued interest in Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a history of extreme price fluctuations and is destructive to the environment and has unequal ownership comments from the big bank out of Switzerland, UBS. And I will stop talking now. Those are some of the headlines that caught my That was awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. All right, folks, we're coming up to the end. I think Aaron knocked it out of the park there. And I think we will call it. 
What a show, folks! Thank you to everyone who contributed and to everyone who listened in. Don't forget to join Cafe Bitcoin by clicking on Cafe Bitcoin at the top left of your screen. And remember to find our full schedule of events at CafeBitcoin.club. We hope to see you again next time for the Bitcoin News Hour.